From the front lines of the Gulf War to recent conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq, David Jackson has reported firsthand on the Middle East crisis for more than a decade. This week, he returns to the war zone to take you up close with the heroes defending freedom a world away. It is good morning. You're right, Pat. That's right. It is already Thanksgiving morning for us. Thursday morning here in this part of the world in Kuwait City. It has dawned clear, as you can see, for the first time since the uh, some, some number of days since we've been here. And, of course, also very cold, which has been coming our way as well. And last night, I was up in uh, the southern portion of Iraq right Right there on the border of Kuwait where you will see as we take a look at some videotape right now where the roads go straight up into Baghdad. We got a chance to stand and talk for a moment with uh, one of the corporals who was there in that platoon and that would be Steven Escalera who is from West Covina. We heard him make reference to his wife back in West Covina and that is where our Dave Clark is right now with his wife who got a chance to see her husband make his way back to safety. Dave. Two of the people in that platoon with him were killed on the way out in a convoy that was hit that ran over a mine on the way down uh, through the uh, roadway there a little bit south of Baghdad and that took place a little over a week ago. All of the, one, all of the men you saw right there, very fortunate they felt to be alive. So. Uh, we're lucky to catch up with them as they cross the border like that. Well, good morning, Pat. It really has turned from summer to winter here just in the span of one day. I think you can still see what we're looking at behind me now. That amounts to a sand and dust storm coming off the deserts here of Kuwait. Some words from Sergeant Christina Aguilera headed up into the war zone. There is a very nervous family who is in Baldwin Park right now watching their daughter on television. And that is where our Dave Clark is at this moment, standing by with them. Dave. <laughs> Dave, I'll tell you what, a lot of people crying over that, that's for sure, and that included Sergeant Aguilera, who was fighting back tears during uh, our discussion with her there and uh, had a hard time doing so, but nice to be able to link those families together like that. Live in Kuwait City, I'm David Jackson. Pat, back to you. Now, David Jackson, Pat Harvey, and Jackie Johnson with weather. You're watching KCAL 9 News at 10. Well, it is a bayou, Pat. It certainly is a dark one at that. We're here in the middle of New Orleans, the city of New Orleans, and it is darkest New Orleans, of course, with no electric power, and you can imagine just how dark this city gets at night, one of the reasons why it is so dangerous. We're right here in the middle of a large military encampment. You'll see behind me a little bit some of the guys from the uh, Oklahoma National Guard, then back a little bit further, back in some of the tents there, we have the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. There was 82nd Airborne in and out of here during the course of the day, and we had U.S. Border Patrol that was here as well, people from Arizona and California who are operating in helicopters out of this area. But as the evacuees fan out, they are going to every state, they are going to California, and they are going into Southern California. One of the questions there being, can Southern California absorb large numbers of evacuees if that's exactly what takes place? And our Stacy Butler standing by right now in Echo Park where she's taking a look at just what the city has planned. Stacy. David, as we speak right now, another bus load of evacuees has just arrived now. Pat, David, and Jackie, back to you. All right, thank, thank you. you for that, Stacy. Well, uh, temperature is very nice where we are, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But, Jackie, we were just talking about the possibility, if there is any, of rain in the region where David is right now, or if there's another uh, tropical depression out there somewhere in the Gulf. That's right, David. You guys have been pretty lucky the last couple of days just dealing with the heat and the humidity, but not so much the rain, correct? Well, that's right. We've had smatterings of rain, Jackie, just a little bit here and there, and it has been very humid. It's been hot in the day. I've got to tell you, though, right now, I think we may have had a, you could tell us better, a front come through here or something because it's kind, it's pleasant. It's not cool, but it is very different than it had been. The skies are clear. We don't have any uh, cloud cover overhead. If it stays exactly like it is right now, there's a lot of people here that would be pleased that at least they have good conditions to work in. David Jackson live in New Orleans tonight, Pat, where the evacuations, as you mentioned a moment ago, are continuing, and we've had some very fortunate rescues as well. We have a lot to show you tonight over the course of the next hour, Pat. My colleague David Jackson is on the ground in South Texas. He's live tonight in Liberty, just south of Houston. David, what's it like where you are? Well, we're getting tremendous gusts of wind right now, Pat. We're just on the western edge of the real brunt, the real force of this storm, although we have had just uh, some really, really powerful gusts of wind in the last little while, and we've had heavy rain. I'm standing just under the overhang here of a school that is in the town of Liberty, Texas, and we are not terribly far to the west of Beaumont, Texas, and that is a town that's going to be hit very hard by this storm. Well, that family is better off tonight, but they are still not really out of the woods because they made their way on the little bit of gas that they were given, 
into Port Arthur where they were put in a shelter. And Port Arthur, of course, right now is bearing the brunt of this storm. I mean, that town is really being hammered. Carrie and Sylvia, we told you just a little while ago, the lines, of course, still lengthy coming into St. Peter's. And uh, we'll take a look behind me right now and show you just what's happened here. It's really gotten cold, as we mentioned. We've talked about these early morning hours being very cold indeed. Now you're looking at fog that is blowing through the area. Uh, at, as we uh, are here at 7 o'clock in the morning and the lines, of course, continuing to file inside. Well, you heard Carlo Mahoney talk about the funeral itself coming up on Friday and then, of course, the nine days of prayer that is in that period of time before they begin the conclave. And uh, he is hoping that uh, he will hear from the Holy Spirit, as he put it, during that time and that that will help him make the decision that he has to make in terms of selecting a new pope. Carrie, Sylvia, back to you. And as I mentioned a moment ago, unfortunately, whoa, beg your pardon here, but we're really catching a serious blast of wind and dirt. Just hang with me for one second. Unfortunately, this whole situation not over for the people of Oklahoma City. I'm up here on top of the mountain uh, where this fire began or close to where it began. It came up over the hill here. And as you can see, the wind blowing very hard. The higher the elevation you are up here, the more the wind is blowing. It's coming right at us. Yeah, we'll have to hope we get missed here. You still there, David? We're, we're about <laughs> 20 feet to the left of these drops, so uh, so far we've been all right. All right, okay, David. David. Uh, boy, these pictures are really telling, uh, telling the story here of, of what's happening there. And David, you know, if you, if you got to move, move, DJ. Get out of there. We're going to move here in just a second, yeah, and get behind the truck. That's right. There's our David Jackson live in Malibu reporting on this fire. As Jerry, we've had gusts up in, a few minutes ago up to about 40 miles an hour. And it really, it creates, it creates its own wind as well, as the firefighters have been telling us. The uh, fire has gotten so big, it sucks the wind down off the top of these hills. We can feel it from where we are, not to mention the fact that it's hot and we're a long distance from it. Uh, it just draws the wind down into this big blaze and feeds on itself. The wind has come through here almost steadily now at a good 35, I guess, miles an hour, but it's, it's still blowing very, very strongly right now. We are right now at the absolute peak of this storm at 4.30 in the morning. And as you can see behind me, this Exxon gas station is not faring terribly well. I had to drag everything that was dry from my own room when the wind and water came smashing through the walls. And everybody in this particular motel felt the same thing. At about 4 o'clock in the morning, they say it was like an explosion. All of a sudden, gusts of wind hitting the building from this side, taking the roof off. It is now midnight in South Louisiana, and there is a sense of relief as people try to begin going back to their homes, finding what's left of their homes as this big hurricane has now passed through this part of the southern United States. Now, I'm standing tonight in New Iberia, Louisiana, where, of course, you just saw all that damage, and that's where we've been mostly for the past 18 hours, but it's a wide section of the state that has been damaged by this hurricane, and another town that was very hard hit is Morgan City, which is about 85 miles to the southeast of where I am tonight. Now, as we saw a little bit earlier, there have been certain and rescue teams that have been in this area from all over the state of Oklahoma, for that matter, all over this part of the United States, and that includes Southern California, some rescue teams from Riverside and Los Angeles counties. Our Kim Baldonado now has a report on some elite forces that will be making their way here to the federal building. It was, I would have to say, one of the quietest large gatherings I think I've ever witnessed at uh, any time. People were very subdued. They were very respectful of the plot of ground that you see behind me right now, which is where the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building used to be. 21st Century Cairo. A place King Tutankhamun could never have imagined. Egypt's director of antiquities climbed through the passageways with me, stooping and crawling and ultimately emerging from the low tunnel that brings you into the presumed burial chamber of the great king. This is every family member, and this is in this particular case all the women of the family. Here you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten women. Children and grown women carved into the back of these tombs. Also gives you an idea how beautiful and elaborate a thing like the Sphinx was when it was all completely painted like this on the exterior because it was not a sandstone object like that. It was a bright, brightly painted blue, yellow, brown. 
This is the Valley of the Kings, one of the traditional burial sites for Egypt's ancient pharaohs. Now, by the early 20th century, when Howard Carter arrived here to begin his archaeological digs, more than 60 of the ancient tombs had already been recognized and identified by archaeologists. It was Howard Carter who believed that somewhere underneath the sand, maybe down the hill a little bit lower from where they were working, there had to be another buried tomb, that tomb being the one of King Tut. So this is a mystery. Then maybe this is a mystery. And this is why I would like to take you and do the adventure. Let's look. Okay. I said yes before I really knew what the mysterious tunnel was like. We will go beneath the Valley of the Kings when we come back in a moment. It is not a place for anyone with claustrophobia. The air is hot. It is heavy with dirt. It is very humid inside exactly the way Zai Hawass likes it, because now we How begin to drop straight down. Head. Can you do this? I think so, but watch the beam over your head. The wall. To show the king, this is a unique scene that you have never seen it in any place at all. This is a closed tomb. The public will never be allowed inside. One of the reasons these tombs are not open to the public is because they worry about damage that can take place to the even artifacts that are along the walls like this, the hieroglyphs along the walls, and you get inside the tomb itself and see again these cut marks on the wall. Look at that. Every swing of the blade that cut the stonework away as they continue to try to go deeper and deeper and deeper into the mountain. It is up to the director of Egypt's antiquities to decide exactly what artifacts from King Tut's tomb or from ancient Egypt ever go on tour. That means Dr. Zai Hawass has final say. People's perception of fighting has been formed in one place, Hollywood. And it's largely a misperception because fighting doesn't look like this. <laughs> What it does look like is often a desperate, clenched struggle that is won more often with skill than just out-and-out -out fury. It was thought that the Michigan judge's ruling that banned clenched fist punching along with headbutting might strip this event of, well, of what the crowd came to see. But if you talk to tonight's organizer of all of this, he'll tell you that's not the case. But that opinion changes when you move right out into the crowd to ask people what they think. Not only do they feel that it's a bad ruling, they also think it is virtually unenforceable. Well, family entertainment or R-rated entertainment, Ultimate Fighting seems to be here to stay. The next bout is July the 12th in Providence, Rhode Island. And I just want to say that from the fighters to the trainers to the people who put on these fights, there are some very friendly, soft-spoken, and polite people there that you get a chance to meet. Might be a little bit surprising, but it turns out that's true, and it'll be interesting to see exactly what the future holds for this so-called outlaw sport. Pat. So now explosives experts have to go through every shred of a plane this size. Again, that's a 747-100 that you're looking at right there behind me. Every shred that they can find of a plane that size and try and analyze it for chemical analysis to try and detect if there was any kind of an explosive planted on board. Needless to say, it's a painstaking process. It's not one that's highly affected by salt water, by the way, for everything that comes up out of the ocean. They can still detect that chemical compound on the parts, but it'll take weeks, maybe months, before they can really pinpoint exactly what may have been responsible for the crash. It certainly could take that long. Live at LAX, I'm David Jackson. Kerry, back to you. That's what they are saying, Pat, in fact, presumed to be dead, along with, of course, 85 others inside what was the Branch Davidian compound about two miles behind me right here. Of course, it being evening or even in the day, for the most part, you can't see much. As we reported yesterday, everything now at this point just leveled. The focus of the problem really here right now tends to be in the town of Baidoa. The Marines have done their best to maintain order here in the capital city of Mogadishu. We've been reporting that for the past week or so, and by and large, that has worked, except that there has been sporadic gunfire here in the city. We've even heard some this morning. But out in Baidoa, it's another story altogether. This is not a city where anybody wants to spend a great deal of time. And before we go tonight, I want to mention real quickly that uh, there is one little element of bright news here, and that is that the Marines have now dropped this leaflet on the people of Baidoa, trying to inform them in a graphic way that the Marines will be there, will be there soon, and will be friendly. And it tells them and explains to them on the back 
that they should greet the Marines and expect the Marines to be people that will be in that town to try and help everybody in a very, very desperate situation. Reporting live from Somalia, I'm David Jackson. Now we go back to the studio. The Marines are now sending reinforcements back into the capital city, and most of those people are coming, of course, from Southern California. And that's where our Joe Avalar is right now. He's standing by at the El Toro Marine Base, where they're getting ready to ship out some more folks. Joe. Well, David, in fact, it's happening right now. Well, that's the situation here live in El Toro now. Back to you, David, in Somalia. All right, thank you very much, Joe Avalar from Southern California tonight. And so far, the Iranians have been abiding by the UN embargo. They have not been allowing anything to be shipped into Iraq through Iran. That remains the case. So there has been no uh, link up economically, let's say, between the two countries. There certainly has been none militarily yet. And Iran has shown no indication to do that. As I say, we don't know specifically uh, what those talks are about. But the fact that they are talking at all is generally viewed as not a good sign from those that are aligned here against Iraq. Finally, we wanted to mention that the weather is changing. First of all, it's cold here in Jordan. And also, there has been a big storm, a rainstorm and a hailstorm in uh, southern Iraq and in southern Kuwait and northern Saudi Arabia that affected some of the American troops there. Very unusual to have that this time of year. They do get rain. Usually it's in January and February. We want to tell you a little bit about what's been taking place in Iraq's capital city of Baghdad, particularly overnight. It is cold and it is clear, and it has been that way now for a couple of days. That means nighttime bombing raids have been at a maximum over Iraq. In the daytime, they let up a little bit, but at night, it's been described as hellacious by some people that have seen it in the capital city. One quick look at it, and you'll probably agree. I'm David Jackson, live in Tuzla, Bosnia, where American men, as we just heard, are finally on the ground, and that was no small achievement. We'll have complete live coverage coming up next on The World Report. Well, Pat and RD, Monday was, in fact, the day we've all been waiting for. The first real break in the weather after almost a week of being socked in here under a very heavy and a very cold fog. The wait has been agonizing for everyone, from a worldwide media contingent to the officers that have been planning the mission. And, of course, getting into this area through the air is only half the battle. Since it's already Tuesday morning over here in Tuzla, you kind of have to update uh, daily the weather reports and weather conditions. It's colder today than it was yesterday. Yesterday was really a rather good day in terms of the weather here, but there's really no way to predict at this early hour whether or not more men and more flights can come in through the air because we really can't tell yet quite how low the ceiling is. But uh, from the early look out here, just a little bit of snow coming down, the prospects are not particularly good. As for yesterday, of course, the American military very happy that they finally made it onto the ground at all. Of course, bearing in mind, it's 6 o'clock in the morning here on Saturday morning, and uh, it is foggy, it is cold, there is no snow coming down, but fog doesn't tend to clear here the same as we might expect to see later in the day. Yesterday, if it's any example, it remained very, very severely fogged in throughout the course of the day. Into Bosnia. And yesterday, of course, was such an unusual day in terms of the weather. They really jammed as many of those flights, those C-130 flights, as they could into the airport. Those are the lights you see behind me are right here at the front gate of the airport. They brought as many of them in as they could. They even flew into the night, which is something I don't think they initially wanted to do. But uh, because they had a little bit of room there and a little bit of visibility, and we don't know what we face today, they tried to bring in as much as they possibly could in that uh, short number of hours that they did have that window. That's just over three years of some of the most vicious fighting ever to take place in this century. Fighting that took the lives of more than two million people before finally the wall was constructed that you see behind me dividing North and South Korea. With one economy booming almost unbelievably and the other one stagnant to the point of collapse, the opportunity has presented itself to strike a deal. For the North to obtain anything even remotely like this, they must allow the nuclear inspectors on to their seven plant sites. But really, the arrangement hasn't been that easy. To say the least, the North has not been fully cooperative. How'd you like to spend your time on a cold and wintry guard tower on the South Korean-North Korean border? Having to spend your hours listening to North Korean propaganda as it comes singing and spoken through giant loudspeakers at you. And here's the main north-south rail line. And you can see up above, everything still delicately wired in place today with explosives to throw all of the concrete down onto the rail line to block any unwanted oncoming traffic. One of the more high-profile people willing to step forward and slam the United States is Japanese television commentator Yotaro Kanaka. He's pro-Japanese, very proud of it, and not afraid to launch an attack on a misguided America. 
A total of 727 wellheads were ignited. They burned for about eight months, and the total loss was about two billion barrels of oil. That's about a four-year supply of Kuwait's oil at current production levels. But it's only 2% of Kuwait's total oil reserves. There's enough oil straight down there to keep this nation pumping the product all the way through the year 2200. Well, get uh, some paper and a pencil to take notes. Tonight's Best Buys will give you some gift ideas. <laughs> now, why did you do that? I had to do that. I was crying for that. Remember those Cabbage Patch? I was just going to say that. The last time we had this time of hysteria of over. Yeah. Moms and pops with They ran out of those, too. Oh, I remember the oh, it was pictures bad, from yeah. Toys R Us. Parents would shove one another to get to them. Sure no did, question. Yeah. Not sending a good example for the kids their parents. Now you can get a Cabbage Patch Kid for them. Oh, they're a dime a dozen. They're everywhere. Yeah, no, you can get them from here to... You know that, huh, David? The next Toys R Us. Yeah, I look at them... <laughs> David, how are they dressed? Garage sales, you can find them. You know. <laughs> oh, yeah, David Scarrow's garage sales, too. You can find My. cabbage patch the more the <laughs> How are your weekend? How are your weekends spent? <laughs> oh my god. Searching. <laughs> yes. Always searching. Garage sale. Who was that in the red dress? That was could have been the bride, but <laughs> turns could have been the groom or the bride. Okay. Turns out we were spared that. <laughs> We've got some problems out there. Okay, David. Do we really, David? Perhaps yes, we you do. Tell me what they yes, are. Yes, we do. Uh, we have fog warnings. Or uh, what are they called? <laughs> no, keep going. You're doing good so far. No, they're called. They're, they're called. They're called. Uh, 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 what are I they like called? that. Era. Fog what? Oh boy. Your head's in a fog. That's my, fog my head advisory. is not in the fog. There is fog out there. Dense fog advisory. In other words, be careful out there during the overnight hours and during the morning hours. <laughs> Who's in a <the> fog? <laughs> I was right. This tur turned out to be true. Patricia, just one uppercut, please. Have you been drinking coffee tonight? Uh, no. Okay. Iced tea. Decaffeinated. <laughs> yeah, the decaf Perhaps from a couple of restaurants that I know. Now. <laughs> Seriously, be careful with the fog out there. Visibility down to a quarter to half a mile along the coast and inland. Oh, there it is. Not a big deal. Not a big weather event here. We're talking about hit and miss showers or sprinkles. And the farther north you go, the better the chances are. I think that's what you said earlier. I think it was. Yeah. yeah. So Most of the clouds. That, yeah. Us. That was a good forecast. Thank you for helping me. <laughs> okay. Coming up, a wedding fit for a prince. Or the rock star who used to be called Prince. That's right. He is hitched. And we will have the details. And on this Valentine's Day, some people are burning, but not with desire.